Okay, we're going to get started to respect everybody's time. Um, I want to uh, welcome everybody today and thank you so much for joining this very important webinar to learn about financial resources and support for Alzheimer's disease caregivers. My name is Lynette Whiteman and it is my honor to work for Congressman Andy Kim. As a former primary caregiver for both my parents, I totally know and understand how challenging this role can be. Today is truly a collaborative effort between three of our New Jersey Congress people, the Alzheimer's Association, Greater New Jersey Chapter, and a wonderful panel of experts who you'll hear from. Our panelists are going to focus on what each of their agencies provide to hopefully make your lives easier. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to all of you and posted to various websites. We will also be emailing the resources and telephone numbers that are discussed today, so no need to frantically take notes. There will be time at the end of the webinar, at, at the end of the uh, presentations for a Q&A section, so please feel free to put them in the chat box. It is now my true honor to introduce Congressman Frank Pallone, who represents the 6th District of New Jersey. Representative Pallone. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Oh, well, thank you. It's always good to be with my colleagues, Representative Kim and Watson Coleman, and collaborate with them. And I just want to thank them for teaming up with me and my, and my staff to, to host this event. And of course, I want to thank our presenters. Uh, I know they have a lot of other things they could be doing, but they have passion for this issue, and they're here with us today because they wanna share the information about resources that really can make a difference in people's lives and for family members. Now, as you know, September is World Alzheimer's Month, so I, I wanna acknowledge the impact that Alzheimer has worldwide and more specifically in our country. More than 6 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease every day, but we know that the disease does not only affect the lives of those living with it, it significantly affects care, uh, caregivers and, and loved ones. Each year, more than 16 million Americans provide more than 17 billion hours of unpaid care for family and friends with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And I'm sure that many of you here have dedicated countless hours to caring for those that are close to you. Now, many times I've spoken with caregivers who have described the toll that Alzheimer's has taken on their families. And it's really heartbreaking to hear the stories of financial strain, anxiety, pain, loss, uh, but we still don't fully understand what causes Alzheimer's or how to cure this disease. But my colleagues and I in Congress are committed to federal research in this area. So in fiscal year 2023, uh, which would be the next fiscal year, uh, Congress seeks to appropriate $3.7 billion for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia research at the National Institutes of Health, which is an increase of $200 million over the previous year. And my committee that I chair, the Energy and Commerce Committee, also developed and passed legislation to establish ARPA-H, which is a new federal research agency that will lead to breakthroughs in diseases like Alzheimer's, ALS, diabetes, and others, and cancer. And I'm also working with Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware on HR 3085, the ENACT Act, which would increase the diversity of participants in clinical trials for Alzheimer's and related dementias and increase the diversity of researchers. And I know this is a priority uh, for a lot of you. So while we're working on these more long-term efforts to eradicate the disease and address its effects, I think it's helpful to hold sessions like this where you all, family members, friends, local leaders, can obtain information about how to access resources that are already in place that are meant to help make your day to day easier. And so hopefully this session will help you access funds, navigate applications, create a dialogue between you and staff that provides these very important services. And I know that we're going to share materials from this event with you later, so you'll have information on who to reach out to if you have questions about these programs. But I also want you to know that our offices are here to support you. So in my office, <coughs> my outreach director is JL Davis. She's on the call. She works in our New Brunswick office, but you can reach out to either of my offices. My staff is available to help you know, for things like the VA about pending applications, putting you in contact with the representative from the Alzheimer's Association or whatever. And you can, you can reach out to my Long Branch office, but I just want to give the numbers. My Long Branch office is 732-571-1140. 
or my New Brunswick office, which is where JL is, at 732-249-889. Well, what does this say? Oh, it's 8892. They have it wrong. 8892. <laughs> I'm looking at it and it has 8895. It was 8892. Um, so before I just hand it off to my colleague, uh, Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman, I just want to thank everyone again for joining us and hope you'll find this uh, webinar to be beneficial. And I'll hand it over now to, uh, to Representative Watson Coleman. Thanks, Bonnie. Hey, thank you, Frank. And, and thanks, Andy, for inviting me, for getting everybody together. And thank each and every one of you for not only being here today so that hopefully we can uh, share some very important information or resources, but because of the work that you do. And thank you for our government representatives who will be sharing this information with you. I know this is the Alzheimer's uh, month and I just don't know anybody, not in my family and not around my, my circle that doesn't know someone who's either caring for someone with Alzheimer's or who, or who has. And it is just an, an incredibly debilitating experience, both for the patient and for the family uh, to go through. So we need to understand for our constituents what resources are available, how we can help families and how we can even help um, uh, uh, the patient. So we're very fortunate today to be joined by people who are advocates and people who are uh, working in this space. There's so much we have to learn. There's so much research that needs to go into this. Um, there are so many protocols and therapies that are being tried out that we need to know whether or not that they are going to work. But in order to do that, we have to have the resources. As a member of uh, New Jersey's delegation on the Appropriations Committee, I, I, I very much look into this issue to ensure that we are addressing Alzheimer's with the respect and with the intentionality and with the urgency that we need to. The impact of Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's-like diseases and just discerning which is what and, and why we have that is so vitally important to each and every one of us. So I thank you uh, for inviting me, Andy, and for Frank for being on here. It's my blessing to be able to work with them, and I hope that you all find this discussion very helpful. I yield back to you, Andy. And I apologize for being late. It was not my fault. It was technology's fault. <laughs> no worries, Bonnie. Great to see you. And, and uh, hey, everyone, um, you know, with, with Bonnie and Frank, you, you really have the all-star team um, when it comes to doing these types of work. Uh, you know, Frank is doing so much when it comes to our health care policy in the House of Representatives and Bonnie on the Appropriations Committee just makes sure that you know, our country is prioritized in terms of where we're spending and that New Jersey, we get our fair share. So thank you so much, Bonnie uh, and Frank, for helping out. Um, I'm Andy Kim, everybody. Thanks for joining on up. And it's my pleasure to be able to help pull this together. Um, I'm, I'm talking to you, to you actually right now from just outside my, my kid's doctor's office because, uh, you know, emergencies come up. And I think that's what everybody on this call knows about is, you know, it's about taking care of our loved ones and, you know, doing everything we can to be able to provide for them. And, um, you know, I, I, I just have to say um, some of the most powerful meetings I've ever had as a member of Congress has been with families that have. Uh, been afflicted with Alzheimer's um, in a loved one to learn about the struggles that they've faced. Um, I've shared with many of you that, um, you know, my father was a medical researcher and dedicated his entire life to trying to cure cancer and Alzheimer's. And he, you know, just very much always made sure that he was meeting with families afflicted by those illnesses and diseases because he wanted to remember it was about the people. It was not just some you know, random science experiment. And the, you know, the research is about improving people's lives, trying to help them out. You know, he himself was a polio survivor and saw scientists, great scientists and minds uh, finally uh, you know, come up with a vaccine for there. And he wanted to pay it forward. Um, and for me, 
I take up that mantle of my family's mission and try to do everything I can to be able to help you all. Um, you know, as Bonnie mentioned, many of us, um, you know, know people uh, who've been um, struggling when it comes to Alzheimer's and dementia and, and other challenges. Just a neighbor of mine, um, you know, had to recently, you know, move out and sell her house because she just needed extra help to be able to support her husband who, uh, who has dementia and just the challenges that, that she's faced to try to take care of him. Um, so I promised her and I promised others that I'd stand there with you to make sure we're doing better and that you're able to live your best life, that you can have the, you know, that level of dignity for your family member who's struggling um, and that you have the support that you need to be able to care for them. And so, you know, when we wanted to pull this together, me, Frank, and Bonnie, we want to make sure that you know about the resources that are out there right now, um, but also know that we're fighting to get more, and that we recognize that we're not doing enough as a country to be able to help support you all. And, you know, this is something that I think, um, you know, we need to make sure that, that um, we're working together on hand in hand. One thing that I found so impressive and, and powerful is just the number of family members who are caregivers that are going through this so tough in their own life, but then they work with the Alzheimer's Association and other groups to advocate on behalf of others too. And I just say that is one of the, the, the greatest examples of selflessness that I've seen. You know, people who are overwhelmed in their own lives, but still recognizing that they wanna do their part to be able to help others out and try to pass along, try to help share the information that they need. I'm grateful for every, all the panelists. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your day this morning to be able to pass along this information. And uh, Lynette from my team, thank you, Lynette, for helping coordinate Andy, uh, oh, Congressman, you're uh, breaking up a little bit. So actually, I didn't hear if you said anything nice about me. So you're going to have to repeat it. But um, you uh, you did break up. I don't know if 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 you could hear me. Okay. All right. We're gonna um, we're gonna move along because uh, the congressman is having some technical di difficulties. Okay. Um, so, Dale, do you want to uh, share the screen? All right. So we're going to get into the presentation part. And for those of you who might have joined a little bit late, I'll, I'll reiterate that this webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out all the information afterwards. So need, no need to take uh, notes. We will get back to you on that. So our first panelist um, is Robin Cohn who's the Director of Programs and Services for the Alzheimer's Association, Greater New Jersey Chapter. And again, the Alzheimer's Association was a full partner on this webinar. So we thank them for helping to pull this together. So Robin, you could take it away. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank the congressional representatives and certainly all of our families who are joining us today for this conversation. I'm Robin Cohn, I'm the Director of Programs and Services for the Greater New Jersey Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. And included within are our telephone numbers, as well as certainly how best to reach us uh, by email. But please know we are here for everyone every single day to be able to support our families and our community members. Next slide, please. What's important to bring into this conversation is to remind all of our families about our vision. Our vision is a world without Alzheimer's and all other related dementia. Our mission of the Alzheimer's Association nationally and internationally, but most importantly here in New Jersey, is to lead the way to end Alzheimer's and all other dementia by accelerating and fueling global research, driving risk reduction strategies, talking to our families about the importance of early detection and diagnoses, 
and maximizing the delivery, the delivery, excuse me, of quality care and support services. Critical to our mission and our passion every single day is to be able to deliver on our mission successfully for our families here in New Jersey. Next slide, please. The resources for families and the community are listed here, and certainly everyone will receive a copy of this, but I'd like to hone in on a couple of key assets of the Alzheimer's Association. One being our 24-7 helpline. That is 800-272-3900. That number is answered by master's trained clinical specialists who answer your call every single day. We speak in over 200 languages. We provide information, resources, information that families can understand in a narrative that is literate, and we are there to help our families. We're also a crisis intervention line. You know that over 72% of people with Alzheimer's and dementia may wander. So we want everyone to know that this number is active, again, 24 seven, always answered by a live person. And that's critically important for all of our families to understand. Another key asset is our community resource finder. This is a portal that is externally facing for all community members. It's a repository of community services, medical supports, home health care, home care services, and a cadre of listings of education programming, caregiver support groups, programs for people living with Alzheimer's and dementia across the entire journey of Alzheimer's and all related dementias. What's important to also mention is that we refer out to respite services in our communities. We work hand in hand with the State Department of Aging to be able to connect our families with the respite program coordinators and the JAG program coordinators in each county by providing a little bit more information about who these individuals are, by providing contact information, by making those types of referrals, our families are knowledgeable, they have the information that they need to be able to make those decisions that they need to make today. And that is critically important. We work with other local Alzheimer's groups. We work certainly across the entire state to be able to bring these services and resources to make the lives of the people living with Alzheimer's and dementia just a little bit easier. We have other resources and services that help families navigate through the journey, including financial resources. And we have so many opportunities for people to not only learn about Alzheimer's and dementia, but to be able to hold their hand to provide the care and support services that they need and to help them with their financial and economic questions and provide those assets to them. Next slide, please. What's important to recognize is that there are so many disparities that the Alzheimer's Association certainly are paying uh, keen attention to, whether it be gender differences, racial differences, and ethnic disparities. But what's important is that we recognize the differences amongst our subpopulations. We understand that almost two thirds of Americans living with Alzheimer's are women. And we know that over 65% of Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers are women. So the work that we're doing in community is to inform and educate our, our women community members to be able to provide for them in ways that perhaps other services and resources may not be able to do so. It's important that we study from a research perspective the disparities, but also to be able to deliver education and information to our older Black and Hispanic Americans as well who are also disproportionately more likely than older white populations to have Alzheimer's and dementia, and also to recognize that we have to have more representation in our clinical trials, underscoring the dire need for more diversity in dementia research. Critically important to be able to bring those resources, those you know, um, educational programs into each neighborhood and zip code within our state of New Jersey. Next slide, please. What's important as well is that the Alzheimer's Association advocated for the Medicare CPT code 99483, 
What's important is that we let our families and our healthcare providers and healthcare systems truly understand the importance of an early diagnosis. And certainly the benefits of such can have not only emotional, social, and medical benefit, but it's very important for our families to understand their symptoms, to have a, a conversation with their healthcare provider team, to expand their care team. And the only way to do that is certainly to have knowledge about this particular CPT code, which I know that my colleague will be talking about, but this allows opportunity to explore therapeutic options improve our health outcomes, especially here in New Jersey, prevent other complications, make those early legal and financial decisions that are certainly critical to be made, as well as access to care services, participation in a well-represented clinical trial, and a certainly have opportunity to better manage cost of care. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, and again, uh, Robin's information will be sent out and the slideshow will be sent out. And if you do have a question for any of the panelists along the way, you don't have to wait to the end. You could put them in the chat room and the chat box on the bottom and we will be getting to them later. Um, so as Robin um, did a perfect segue for our next speaker, who is going to be talking about the, the Medicare code 99483, which you might not know about, and I hope you'll be able to take advantage of. So our next presenter is Gary Skoll, who is the founder of Al's Better. So Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. So just as Robin mentioned, I'm going to be talking about some of the new Medicare codes, particularly 99483, that have come out that are providing tremendous amounts of resources for families that are caring for a loved one living with dementia. We recognize that people who provide support, such as spouses, children, and even professional hired caregivers, are under tremendous amounts of stress. Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia are really unlike any other type of disease and the care process is far more challenging. Individuals can be living with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, vascular dementia and Lewy body dementia. It could be any combination of this. Uh, they can also have health conditions that are associated with that are made worse by the dementia, such as heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and so forth. Additionally, they can have mental health challenges, not only for the person living with dementia, but the care partners that are supporting them. This could include anxiety, depression, and even just stress. When you put all of this together, it makes supporting caring for a person living with a cognitive impairment extremely challenging. And unfortunately, up until recently, Medicare did not offer that much to support those families that are providing this type of care. But with some of these newer codes, such as 99483, there's now a great deal of support available to families. The first question that we usually get is, what does a person need to qualify for this program? Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So in order to qualify, it's very simple. They need to have a suspicion of a cognitive impairment. And this is really important. They don't need a formal diagnosis by a physician. So if your loved one you feel may have a cognitive impairment, maybe their memory is impaired, maybe they're having other types of behavioral issues that could be caused by a cognitive impairment, that's all they need. They need to have Medicare. So if they're 65 or over or they have Medicare, it could be straight Medicare, it could be a Medicare Advantage plan, that also helps to qualify. And lastly, they can't be on hospice. If they're on hospice, unfortunately, they will not qualify for the program. Hospice has their own services that they're providing. So qualifying for the program is really very simple. The next thing people wanna typically know is what does the program offer? Next slide, please. So the program that we've put together starts with a clinician. And that clinician could be, we partnered with a company called Angelic Health, and we've trained care uh, partners, um, the clinicians, the nurse practitioners, how to care for people that are living with dementia. Because from a clinical standpoint, it's very different than caring for people that are not living with dementia. So they're trained on things such as medications, not only what dementia medications are out there, 
but potentially what medications could be causing problems with the specific type of dementia that the person has. And sometimes, unfortunately, not all physicians understand this. We then partner that clinician with what we call a dementia coach. Now that dementia coach is gonna provide ongoing support to families. And that could come in many different forms. They look at behaviors that people may be having. Now those behaviors could be things such as hallucinating, agitation, wandering, repeating things over and over. You can't get your loved one to bathe. You can't get them to eat. It could be any of these unmet needs that are out there. And these unmet needs, unfortunately, can cause a great deal of stress to the people that are providing the care. So the coach's idea is to work with those families to help minimize or hopefully even eliminate some of these stresses. The coach also looks for community resources that may be available, such as how to pay for care, possibly through the VA or some other resources, possibly adult day programs that are out there, support groups that are out there, and so much more. Additionally, we bring in behavioral health because people living with dementia are often accompanied with agitation. Uh, they're often accompanied with depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. But it's not only the person living with dementia, it's also the care partners. And when that care partner is affected, that affects the care that's also provided to the person living with dementia. Next slide, please. So some of the resources that are provided through our program would include um, a book. So we've written a manual that we mail out a physical manual to each family that's participating in this program. And that book is gonna give them tips on how to manage and care for someone living with dementia. We also have a mobile app that's now available. And that mobile app has a full self-help library available. So if your loved one is wandering, you can simply look up the wandering lesson. It's three to five minutes long. It has a video that's part of it that teaches you how to manage that type of situation. But in addition to that, it teaches you how to look for the root causes and what may be available to them. Um, additionally, the coach can identify these issues and then send a text message or an email with that specific lesson. And what we've learned is that if someone is living with a person that is hallucinating, for example, they don't need to spend time learning about bathing or agitation. They need to identify that problem and be able to manage that program. Part of the program is also ongoing virtual coaching. So this could be telephonically done, or this could be done via a video chat. And because of the progressive nature of Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, somebody can be fine one week and then the next week, it could be a real mess and they could have lots of challenging. The ongoing process of having a coach that knows you, knows your situation that you have a relationship with, provides you that type of support on an ongoing basis. They can also help locate support groups such as through the Alzheimer's Association. So all of these things are part of the program and it's all paid for through Medicare. Now there may be a copay involved through Medicare. If you have a co-insurance that's usually covered, but our staff would help identify if there is any type of co-payment involved, if your insurance, your Medicare is accepted by this program and it's very easy and fast to get started on the program. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, that was great information. And again, we will uh, send out Gary's contact information when we send out the slides to everybody. So if anybody has any follow-up questions or wants to learn more about this, um, they could contact Gary. Our next speaker is going to be Jennifer Myers, who is the Public Affairs Officer for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and she will be talking about the support for caregivers that um, those of you who are caring for veterans are eligible for. So Jennifer, let's take it away. Thank you and good morning. Um, thank you for the invitation to participate in this discussion and, uh, on this very important topic. Um, as mentioned before, my name is Jennifer Myers. I'm retired Air Force, and I'm the Public Affairs and Management Analyst for the Department of Veterans Affairs, Newark Regional Office. So this morning, I'm going to share some key information regarding VA services that are available to veterans with dementia uh, and or Alzheimer's and caregiver support. Next slide. 
So just briefly, the structure of VA. VA is broken into three areas, VBA, which is the benefit side of the house, VHA, which is the Veterans Health Care Administration, and then NCA, which is National Cemetery Administration. So those burial services. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about what is available for our caregivers. What support does VA offer to, um, to veterans with dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So primarily we offer support groups and educational presentations to caregivers of veterans in both general and diag diagnosing specific areas. Next, um, the question, and these are just some really basic questions that I think are, are the platform um, for many of those who are looking for assistance and support. So what is the program of general caregiver support services and the program of comprehensive assistance to family caregivers? Well, the general caregiver support services serves caregivers and veterans of all eras um, with no service connection requirements. So one would not need to have be service connected. And that, when we talk about service connection, that is um, receiving compensation disabilities. That is not a requirement. However, the veteran must be enrolled in the VA healthcare system, okay? And have personal care needs. That is gonna be key. This program is an outpatient program. So just to go over it, um, one does not need to be service connected, but they need to be, the veteran would need to be enrolled in the, in the VA healthcare system. Next slide. Okay, what are some of the general um, qualifications, level of needs or um, disease elements are required are needed in order to qualify for this program. So the, the main thing um, for, and this is a, um, a specific program and that is the PCA, PCAFC program. And that is the program of comprehensive care for family caregivers. In this instance, um, for one to be quali to qualify, that individual would have to be 70% or more service connected and um, and have a need for assistance with with daily living activity. Um, again, that individual would need to be enrolled in the VA healthcare system, and their medical records will be examined as part of the application process. So. Um, that individual is important, and I can't say it enough, you'll see throughout the, this brief presentation, enrollment in the VA healthcare system is going to be key, okay? What is the process to apply for support? Apply online. Very simple, they'd have to apply online. How long does it take? The process can take anywhere from a few weeks to, to a few months, depending on, on the factors involved. If approved, payment, um, there is a payment that's involved and that's if we're going with the, the PCAFC program. Um, if we're not looking into that program, but just basic support, um, you can always apply apply for that support as well, and reach out um, again to our VA healthcare facilities um, for, in for information regarding what is available. Next slide. Who should caregivers contact to get the application process started? www.caregiver.va.gov, that's gonna be key www.caregiver.va.gov. And if you look on the screen, I've also provided the number for one to call if they wish to speak to someone regarding VA caregiver support. And that is 1-855-260-3274. Again, 855-260-3274. 
Now, in addition to um, federal government support, there's also state support that's available for New Jersey veterans. Um, and just, I wanna key in on one key part, New Jersey operates three facilities for veterans who require long-term nursing home care. So if you find that um, if you have a veteran in your care that requires nurse, long-term nursing care support, that number to call, 973-297-3230. And someone from the state, New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs will contact you and guide you as to um, which of the facilities would be best for that veteran and qualifications. And that's all that I have. I wanna thank everybody for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And again, if you didn't get all those phone numbers or the websites, don't worry about it. We're gonna email all of that out to you afterwards. And I see people are writing uh, questions in the Q&A or the chat box. So continue to do that. We're monitoring it as we go along and we'll get to your questions at the end of the presentations. So now last but definitely not least, our uh, last panelist is Jennifer Rutberg, who is the Caregiver Program Specialist for the New Jersey Division of Aging Services and she will be talking about what resources they offer. So Jennifer, back to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, again, my name is Jennifer Rutberg and I'm from the New Jersey State Division of Aging Services, which is part of the State Department of Human Services. And so there are a lot of programs and services under the department. I'm going to really focus in on what the division does and the financial assistance that we provide for people living with Alzheimer's and their caregivers. Next slide, please. So the way we work is the Division of Aging Services administers programs that benefit older adults, their families, and their other supports, as well as disabled adults. Much of our work involves Older Americans Act funds. And we, what we do is we filter those down to the county level so that those counties can tailor those services to what's available and what's needed in your county. New Jersey is a small but mighty state. We've got 21 counties and each one has its own character. Um, it's got its own resources, it's got its own strengths. And so each county, we want them to be able to best meet the needs of the people who live in that county. So the Division of Aging Services acts on the department's behalf to act as the state unit on aging. And those county offices on aging have various names, such as the, we call them AAAs and ADRCs. Those acronyms simply means your county office on aging. It could be your division of senior services in your county, senior citizens and veterans affairs. They go by different names in your county, but it's always some variation of that. The federal designation, whenever you see AAA ADRC, is area agency on aging. So we're the state unit on aging, and then the county level is the area agency on aging. They're also aging and disability resource connections. So they have a great deal of information to also help with adults with disabilities and can point you in the right direction, make those connections. They may provide services directly themselves. So one of the nice things and one of the primary things that these county offices on aging do is provide information and connection as well as direct services. So through those offices on aging, we've got that direct connection in your county. Other things that our division at the state level does is we include the financial benefits programs that help offset costs of care, medication, such as PAAD and senior gold. We do elder justice, such as adult protective services, which again is also in every county. 
the PACE programs, often known as LIFE programs here in New Jersey, uh, which provide comprehensive care to seniors with medical needs who are living at home. And that's a wonderful program. We also have health maintenance programs such as Project Healthy Bones um, and uh, fall prevention programs to help keep adults safe at home in their homes where they wanna be, as well as those direct care options. Next slide, please. Oh, I don't know why it's, oh, we got fancy and we're, we're, uh, we're going through. So I don't know if there's a click through so that all of those options show up. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are just some basic categories. Uh, there are a lot of programs and services through the Division of Aging Services and through our partners at the county levels. So you can see under programs, we do screening for managed long-term services and supports, which is a Medicaid program for those who meet a nursing home level of care, no matter where they wanna live whether they wanna live at home or if they need to live in a facility. We do the NJ Save, which is an application for multiple programs. And I'm gonna show you the financial savings um, through that application. That includes the pharmaceutical assistance, Medicare assistance, utility assistance, um, food assistance. There are a lot of things through that one application. There's the SHIP, Medicare counselors. Uh, they are available in every single county, and they're absolutely wonderful in helping to sort out any of your Medicare questions, your billing issues, the issues with the new codes uh, that Gary was discussing, anything to do with Medicare, and your SHIP counselor in your county can assist you. We also have higher level access so, they can, so that um, SHIP counselors in our offices can talk directly with Medicare and help sort things out for you. We have programs such as JAC, which are for people who are not on Medicaid, who want to, who need a nursing home level of care um, and want to stay in the community. Again, we have adult protective services. We've got both congregate setting meals in senior centers, as well as home delivered meals. We've got respite programs to be able to assist people with who are taking care of somebody with any kind of an Alzheimer's or other cognitive impairment, as well as any other kind of frailty or condition where they need the care of another person. And that's a tremendous savings financially, as well as just practically for caregivers. There's also the Alzheimer's Adult Day Services Program, which offsets the cost of daycare services for somebody specifically with a cognitive impairment. That's all that program does. It's terrific, especially for working caregivers. Uh, allows you to be able to do your work, to be able to go to work or work from home and have your family member be taken care of in a usually very fun environment, but that's designed so that they can succeed, so that they can have a good time, so that they can have their medical needs, their care needs taken care of. The National Family Caregiver Support Program is through the Older Americans Act, and that provides a variety of services and supports for caregivers. And the PACE Life programs that I mentioned before. As part of this, and as part of the general information, we've got information, application assistance, legal assistance, the pharmaceutical assistance, socialization and recreation, transportation, those county buses that drive seniors, that's through the funding that we, that we uh, give out to the counties. Telephone reassurance uh, programs, which can also help a caregiver to know that there is other contact to your loved one support groups, education, including caregiver education, even the farmer's market vouchers. These are all assistance, both practically and financially that we do. So every county 
in that Office on Aging does a, a needs assessment of what services are most needed, again, so that they can target things. And they do requests for proposals to match local providers with, uh, the, um, with seniors, with funding to be able to provide services. Next slide, please. I wanna just show you the NJ save. This is just an example of some of the financial savings through our services. Now, again, this is through one application. It's not multiple applications, it's one application. It's a lengthy application. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you it's not. One of the nice things is if you do this application online is, is that it will start to automatically skip the sections that don't apply to you. And it makes it a lot easier. The Offices on Aging can also assist you in doing the application. It's called an NJ Save application, as in saving you money. You can see here that many people, they can have their Medicare Part B paid for. They can have the low income savings also for prescription coverage and out of pocket costs. The Universal Service Fund is also through this application. That's for utility assistance, for your gas and your electric bills. Then you've got LIHEAP, which is also utility assistance for your heating and your cooling. Then of course, you've got PAAD, the Pharmaceutical Assistance for the Aged and Disabled. And that also has senior gold, which is for people whose income is a little higher. Those income requirements went up by $10,000 a year for income this year. So everybody on senior gold last year now qualifies directly for PAAD. And people who never qualified before now can qualify for senior gold. It's been fantastic. And then there's also the paying of some of the Part D, which is, ama which is amazing. Because these are all things that come out of your social security automatically and people need that money in their pockets. And that NJ Save application does this. You've got hearing aid assistance. You've got, again, senior gold. These are all things through that one application with NJ Save. You also can have additional pieces, such as it helps to get you your property tax frozen, uh, low cost spaying and neutering for pets. There are a wide variety of services that go through that. NJ save application. And once you get approved for say PAAD or senior gold. Next slide, please. So the question is, how do we get this? How do we apply for this? Your best thing to do is call your county office on aging. The, we have, we're all part of a, what we call a no wrong door system. So any way that you enter, you're going to hopefully be connected with the services and supports that you need. You can call your office on aging either directly with your county number, and there's a link there at the bottom of the slide for the listing of the county offices on aging. But you can also call that 1877 number, and that will connect you with your county. You may speak to our office first because of the geolocation with cell phones and so forth. Um, but they will connect you with your county if it doesn't go there directly. We have, as the Aging and Disability Resource Connection, we also have the ADRC website, which is adrcnj.org. Or you can go to aging.nj.gov, which is the State Division on Aging's website. Again, that's aging dot nj dot gov and that has a huge wealth of information on there and again you can be connected with your county office on aging which is the gateway for many many things such as the jack program for getting screened for um, mltss and other medicaid programs for getting screened for any of our our services is through that office on aging so 
I think next up, we probably have Q&A and anything from the chat, but I want to thank everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you to our legislators for creating this event. Thank you for the Alzheimer's Association, for Alz Connect, and for the VA to partner on this. And thank you very much for including the New Jersey Division of Aging Services. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I know that was a lot, a lot of information and a lot, a lot of wonderful programs. But I think, as Jennifer said, if you just call that number, that will get you into the system and you'll talk to somebody and then you'll navigate your way. The same for the VA, the same for like Gary, the same for Alzheimer's. Just pick up the phone, make that call, and then they'll point you in the right direction. So I am going to turn it over now to my uh, two wonderful colleagues who helped to make this possible today. Uh, JL Davis is the Outreach Director for Congressman Frank Pallone, and Delara Bostepi is the Deputy Director of Communications for Congresswoman Watson Coleman for the Q&A. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Annette. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panelists, um, everyone who's been submitting their questions. I just want to remind everybody uh, that we will be taking all these questions, uh, even if we don't get to answer them today. So continue to submit them. We'll make sure that we get back to them. Um, I want to start out with a question for, I believe this would be a good question for Robin Cohn. If you could explain the respite care grant and what is required to qualify for it. The Alzheimer's Association actually does not have the respite program grant to administer. What we do is that we refer out to uh, exactly how Jennifer had described to each county's respite program, uh, you know, offices, and um, and then also Alzheimer's New Jersey has a grant that is available for families, and we refer out to them. Uh, as, as a local referral. The Alzheimer's Association, what we do is that we certainly have the opportunity to talk about financial resources and to connect them with the VA that we just heard from, from our colleague, as well as certainly each county. And we help them to navigate through that as well as providing them with information and professionals that might be able to provide more interpretation of certainly the information that they are seeking. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, um, Robin. If, so, if I could, about the statewide, I think the question may have also been about the statewide respite care program, which the Alzheimer's Association very actively refers over to and connects, which is fantastic. Um, the statewide respite care program is to help benefit caregivers who are uncompensated who are not getting paid for their, for their support of the person. And it's to help give them a break, either for a short intensive period or for an ongoing but periodic support. And it's a wonderful thing to enable that caregiver the break that they need to be able to continue being a caregiver. A lot of the use of the statewide respite care program, unfortunately, is when a crisis happens. It's when the caregiver is so exhausted or hasn't been taking care of their own health, and sometimes they, they need to go to the hospital. Um, they may have injured themselves or had a cardiac episode. Um, and so they go in the hospital and statewide respite is able to provide temporary care either in the home or in a facility so that that caregiver can get better and come back to being a caregiver. What we like to do is do some early intervention and provide services to give that caregiver a periodic break so that they don't have that crisis, so that they can take care of themselves, their own medical needs, just get out to the supermarket to be able to get your hair done without having to worry about what's happening at home. So any kind of a respite service is a fantastic one, whether it's through statewide respite, the Alzheimer's Adult Day Services Program, or any of our other services. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that MLTSS, which is that higher level of Medicaid for people who need a nursing home level of care, no matter where they live, if they are living at home and they have a caregiver, there is actually very robust caregiver respite services on top of what the participant is eligible for by themselves. 
And a lot of people don't realize that and they don't talk to their care manager from their managed care organization about that. So word to the wise for everybody. Awesome, thanks, Jennifer. So we're gonna turn to Gary for a couple of questions uh, related to your presentation. So you discussed the Medicare code 99483. So I'm gonna ask a few questions here. Is this something that doctors are familiar with, this code? Um, and if not, what should someone do if their doctor is unfamiliar with it? Also, um, is this something that's also available to people with developmental disabilities? And do other states have these programs? Hopefully that's not too much for you to answer at once. So um, a lot of good questions there. I think the first question is about the doctors. And unfortunately, and one of the reasons we're having this presentation today is that not enough people know about this. And in many cases, physicians do not know that this code exists. Uh, so that I think is one of the biggest problems. I know the Alzheimer's Association made a, a pretty big push a few years ago to try and educate as many physicians and the general public about the code. One of the problems is it's a pretty complex code and, and so doctors don't always work with the code. This is something that if somebody has a physician or a nurse practitioner, any type of clinician that can bill for this code, we would be happy to get involved with them. And if they wanted to work with us, our coaches can actually partner with those physicians or clinicians to do this code and provide the services and make it a lot easier for them to administer. Um, as far as developmentally disabled, this is a, a code for people with a cognitive impairment. So if somebody qualifies with a cognitive impairment, they would qualify. They do have to have Medicare in order to qualify for this. Unfortunately, many people with developmental disabilities do go on to develop a form of dementia. Uh, so there's a very good chance that they would qualify for this program. Is it available in other states? This is a, a Medicare code, so it is available everywhere. Whether or not people in other places can actually use the code there, not everybody does use this code. Uh, they just don't know about it or they don't have programs in place for it. So. Here in New Jersey, we cover the entire state. So New Jersey is pretty fortunate that we do cover that and it is available, but this is available everywhere. Thanks, Carrie. And let me see what other questions we can get answered here. So Jennifer Myers, we have a question related to the VA programs that you discussed. Are these only if the patient is a veteran? Does it offer any support for the spouse of a veteran where the veteran is the caregiver? So I think it's kind of like reversing what you would think to be the norm as in the veteran is giving care to a family member. If the veteran's giving care, um, there may be some provisions um, with the state, not necessarily through VA. So again, I would highly recommend that they reach out to their to the state, New Jersey Department of Military and Veterans Affairs as a resource. And that was with 973-297-3230. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying, Jennifer. Um, so this is a general question that I'll open to everyone. What's the difference between having Medicare and Medicaid as it relates to support help? Um, and if you wanna take a stab at that briefly, then you can just unmute. I think the, the easiest thing to, under, to, to, to wrap your head around this difference because many people think that Medicare is going to take care of everything and, and it doesn't. I like to think of Medicare as, take, as health insurance, like your Blue Cross or anything like that. It's going to take care of your short-term rehabilitative needs. It is not designed to provide long-term care. Medicaid does both, but it's for people with lower income or whose income exceeds their care needs. And for people who need a nursing home level of care or going to, but their income or excuse me, not even nursing home level of care, but just higher care needs, 
then there are ways to qualify for Medicaid, such as medically needy or qualified income trust. So don't give up if you think your income is too high, but you're blowing through your savings, as unfortunately too many people do because of their high care needs. So don't give up, call your office on aging and explore those, those possibilities. But that's usually how I differentiate it. Medicare, short-term rehabilitative, Medicaid, when income is, is an issue and you need both assistances for regular care, as well as for your rehabilitative and, and immediate medical needs. Does anybody else have a different interpretation or other things to add? The only thing I would add to that is that um, Medicaid is typically more long-term where Medicare is immediate needs. However, there are some Medicare codes such as chronic care management codes that are ongoing. So depending on the situation, Medicare may pay for certain things that are ongoing needs. Yep. Unfortunately, they're not going to be paying typically for things like adult daycare, for custodial level um, nursing, you know, home health aid care and so forth, um, which is unfortunately one of the things that's so often needed when people do have a dementia. Agree. Awesome. Thank you both for chiming in on that. And I recognize that we're at 11.03 here, so we're going to wrap up, but I want to present one last question to all of the presenters, if you could just keep your answer very brief. Um, but we just had some general questions about how to afford care facilities for um, dementia or Alzheimer's patients. So I guess one last word as to what's the first step that someone should take if they are a caregiver of someone who has Alzheimer's. So um, Robin, did you want to start? I would like to just reiterate the 1-800-HELPLINE number. That's 800-272-3900, available 24-7. We could help families locally to be able to access the information that they need and to get the care and support services immediately. Thank you. Thanks, let's go to Gary next. So the question was about what people need to, in order to pay for a facility? Yeah, what are the first steps that someone should take if they're looking to uh, get fin financial assistance for someone who has Alzheimer's? So I think there's multiple types of facilities that are out there and it depends on their level of dementia. Um, I think that they should speak to their physician first and try and make sure there's a diagnosis and see where they're at. There are facilities that have memory care units. There's assisted living type facilities. So it really depends on what their needs are going to be. Some facilities accept Medicaid. Other facilities are really looking more for private pay. Uh, so again, it, it really depends. Elder law attorneys are also a very good resource in this way where they can help somebody to qualify for certain programs. So I don't know that there is one single answer for this, unfortunately, but I do think there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, again, part of the program that we provide as well, the coach does help people figure out what they may qualify for and how to find facilities that may be right for them. Thanks, Gary. And let's go to Jennifer Myers. So just yes. a general question of where should I get started? Start off with um, the 1-800 number that I provided for for VA caregiver support line, and that would be 855-260-3274 or www.caregiver.va.gov. Thanks, and last but not least, Jennifer Rupberg. The County Office on Aging is definitely your first place to go. you're uh, freezing up a little bit, unfortunately. Is this a little better? Yes. Okay, good. Um, the, I was taxing my computer a bit. The, um, uh, calling the Office on Aging, but also calling any of the organizations here, we all are happy to help and connect. Um, this is what we all do. This is what we all care about, is taking care of people in need. 
people. And let's face it, we all need some help. What we typically see, and I don't know if the other panelists would agree, but we typically see people who've waited until there's a crisis. And we don't want anybody to wait until there's a crisis. It's usually best to get information when you can think about it, when you can talk about it, make decisions with a cooler head. Um, crisis, it's never a good time to make a decision. So please call now, please reach out, get that information, and don't be afraid to ask and ask again. We're all here to help. We all have different pieces of the pie and we like to be able to work together. So I'm always happy when somebody reaches me directly and I can connect to them, I can work with them. So are our offices on aging. So I know it's been my experience with the VA. So I know it's been my experience with the Alzheimer's Association and so many other organizations. So please reach out. Well, thank you so much to everybody, uh, to all the panelists. Um, I want to uh, give a thank you to Brooke Lockwood from the Alzheimer's Association who helped to coordinate this event with us. Um, I want to thank uh, Congressman Pallone, Congresswoman Watson Coleman, and Congressman Kim, and uh, Jay Allen Delara. Everybody worked really hard to bring this information to you. And I, and I hope you did learn something. And there is a telephone number that you jotted down that you will call that will make your life just a little bit easier. Be on the lookout for the PowerPoint presentation and the resources discussed. And um, the three congressional offices will have our telephone numbers in there. So if there's any information or any help we could be, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.